Welcome to the Story Powers Podcast, the show about the power of stories, the people who tell them, and why you should be doing it too. I'm your host, Francisco Mafus. My guest today is Hassan Yax. He's the CEO of Leader Story, a company that uses the power of story to build strong brands and company culture. I could say a whole lot more about him, but he's done so many impressive things that looking at his CV is making me feel lazy and incompetent, so I'll spare you the same pain. We'll get into some of the craziest stuff, and you'll see what I'm talking about. If you like the show, please subscribe and leave us an iTunes review. If this podcast ever hits the big time, I promise I'll remember who supported me from the start. And also, who hasn't? Mum, where is that review you promised me? Ladies and gentlemen, Hassani X. Hassani, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Francisco. I appreciate the uh, intro. You know, you, you're very prepared for, for podcast interviews and you make it very easy on your hosts. But then, you know, I, I do my own research and then I did a bit and then I got some of the stuff you sent me before and I just couldn't cope with it. So <laughs> I thought that if I started attacking everything that was there, um, we would never get out of the introduction. I, I try to make things as easy as possible and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be transparent from the jump. My clients tell me, this is what people tell me. I help them feel at the same time, super, super excited in one moment and then defeated in the next. And that's because I like, if you ask me to do something or to engage in something, I'm going to be like, boom, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a do it. And I'm going to throw it at you at a level. And then you're like, you were expecting the bare minimum. And it feels overwhelming a little bit sometimes to get that level of engagement. So it's a it's a training process for if you're in my circle, I'm going to give it to you and I'm going to give you everything necessary for you to say, here's the ball. Now it's your turn to shoot. And I think a lot of us don't want the ball. Sometimes we don't really want to shoot. We say we do, but we really don't. Well, I must say that when I came across your content for the first time, I was first very impressed, but then I. I was a little worried mm -hmm. and I was worried because I showed some of your videos to my wife and she actually asked to see more of them, but she never has any time for my stuff. So either she likes your storytelling better than mine, or maybe I shouldn't leave the two, two of you alone in the same room. <laughs> you, you, you heard the, 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 um, what is the, um, the quote, you can't be a prophet in your own kingdom. Mm. You hear that? Mm -hmm. So it's just, just sometimes it's refreshing to hear something different. Um, my wife's the same yes, way. Yes, yes, that's that's my, one way of looking at it. My wife is the same <laughs> way. My wife does not know anything about what I say, what I do. It, to her, what I do online or my meet my videos are like she she is completely out of the loop. So your your wife is at least listening to your story. So that's 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 a, that's a thumbs up right there. Well, I think I think she was watching some of your videos on mute. So I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> Oh, I got captions. I got captions in my video. <laughs> oh, yes, captions. Yes, captions. That that must have been it. Um, yeah, but the one thing I, I find interesting about how, you know, you having given me some information beforehand is I just had this conversation last week with a guy called Brian Miller, right, who is, uh, he's got a very big TEDx, uh, he's a magician. And one of the things he talks about in, in his book, and we talked about on the on the podcast, was that he finds himself somewhat frustrated sometimes because he has the same conversations over and over. So he goes into a podcast and people say, oh, that story you told on your TEDx, can you tell that again? And he says, well, sure, but it's out there. So don't you find that with providing some information to your hosts beforehand that they just ask you to talk about the things you've talked about a million times before? They have, they, and, and it does, and that's purposeful. One of the things about building a strong brand is becoming comfortable with saying the same thing over and over and over and over again. And I'm, I am just as guilty of feeling this pressure to like, I want to say something different. I want to, I want to explore different things. But if you're trying to build anything, you're trying to become known for something, you're trying to build an audience, it's important for you to be super clear about who you are, what you stand for, and the stories that emotionally connect you to your audience. And if you, if you veer off from that out of this need to want to do things different, which I do, I'm guilty of, it dilutes the brand, right? Um, so my coaches and the people I'm around, they have to remind me. Shut up and say the thing that you are here to say. 
there will be a time to open up and, 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 and explore different aspects of what you're doing. But if you're trying to build something, it's hard enough as it is in this noisy market to get attention. So stay there, own that space, carve out a piece of people's psyche as it relates to the space that you want to dominate. And it's going to come from saying the same thing over and over again that resonates and connects until people know your story. Oh, I know it, Francis. I, I remember Francisco's story. They're going to remember. But if you're not saying it and you're changing it every other day or across different shows, you're, you're not doing your job as it relates to building that brand. Well, let me see if I can challenge that to a little bit and get you to say the same things, but from a slightly different angle. And, and which leads me to one of the things I wanted to cover right at the beginning, which is the way I came across you is a, is a way I know other people have come across you, which is your five second, 30 second and one minute stories. Yeah. And, and I, I thought that was incredibly powerful. But what I haven't seen you do, and this is what I would like you to do, is do that with your story. So, so you do that as examples for other other people, and right. even with a host and a podcast, mm -hmm. I haven't seen you do that for you. Yeah, right. right. Uh, good question. So let me give the backdrop. What is the five second, thirty second, and five minute story? Whenever I, I work with a lot of entrepreneurs and people in corporate America, and they're trying to find a way to connect with people, and one of the questions we hear all the time is, "What do you do?" And the first thing we do is we come back with a title or the name of a business, and you, you if if you're uh, if you're tuned in, you can see people rolling their eyes and, and being out of the conversation immediately. So the psychology of making an impression is to understand that people care about two things and, and two things in general, the problems that they are having and how to escape them. And what is the promise on the other side of escaping them? So when you talk about trying to introduce yourself to someone, the, the, the five second story is positioning what you do as a way that you can help someone. It's basically answering the question, what can you do for me? Not what do you do? So if you could like put that hack into your, your mind, what do you do for me? So it depends. If I'm, if I'm in a room full of startups, my five second story might be, I'll help you say what you need to say so that you can get your first set of clients in the door. Now, if I'm in front of a startup, an entrepreneur, that's going to invoke a what? Yeah, that's, that's what they need to do. Yeah, they're okay, going to, well, they're going to say, well, how do you do that? When you, introduce, when you say the right thing, it's going to invoke an engagement. They're going to say something to the effect, well, how do you do that? That sounds interesting. If I said, I do marketing. Oh, all right. Yeah. All right. On to the next. So it depends on the room I'm in and, and the context in which I went. So that would be something I might say if I'm in a room full of startups, if I'm in a room full of, say, I, I have businesses who are publicly traded. And for them, we're doing high level brand and strategy development. Like, what is the core of your message? What, what is the essence of, of who you are and what you stand for? What are your values? And what is the feeling you want associated with your brand? So I might say they already have marketing in place. I might say, well, I help people feel the way they want to about your brand, right? I, I help them feel a certain way about your brand. How do you want people to feel about your brand? I said that in five seconds and 90% of the people I'm talking to about their brand can't answer that question. And that is what? Invoke a conversation. So that's the five second story. We have a formula. If you go to a uh, matter of fact, at the end of this, I make sure to remind you, I'll, I'll send a link to the five second, 30 second and uh, five minute story. Um, for people to get access to it. But um, it's a five minute video, which walks you through how to do all three of those different stories. That's how I came across you originally. And if I recall correctly, the, the five second is I help. The right. second, the 30 second is, you know, and then you just broaden a bit what the issue that people are facing right. is. And then the one minute, then it's just a condensed version of a much bigger uh, right. story. Right. So at 30 second, instead of leaping into how you help, you just you set the stage. So again, going back to the startup situation, I may like, you know, you know, a lot of startups, they have a really good product, but they find it difficult to get those first movers in the door and to really explain what they do. That gets someone to nod their head like, yeah, I, I, I do know that. And I say, well, I, I help them overcome that. I help them to say what they need to say. So that those first movers get it and want to buy. That was maybe 17 seconds. Yeah. So the you know is just the bridge to to set the person up to listen at a deeper level. 
you might say that story when you have a group and you're huddled around five, six people and everyone's taking their turn explaining what they do. You'll pull the air out of the room when you say that because everyone is going to turn around and say, I want to talk to him or I want to talk to her. So that's the 30 second. The one minute is when you have the captive audience and you really want to dig into the story. You tell why you do what you do. And then that transitions into the 30 second and ends with the five second. And I know you I know you're familiar with with Donald Miller. Mm -hmm. Have you by any chance read his book, A Million Miles in a Thousand Years? No, no. Okay. Uh, Story Brand. I read Story Brand, but I, I'm not familiar with it. Is, is that he has a new book? Is that the newer one? No. So this was before. Okay. This is this is this is very interesting because this was before he got into story, mm -hmm. right? So this is this is something he says on the book. I'm not. I'm paraphrasing, but he says something like, "No one would watch a movie about someone wanting a Volvo, but most people actually live those stories." So in what he what he's saying there is. If what we choose to do with our lives won't make for a meaningful story, it also won't make for a meaningful life. And that's that. So, that whole book is about how he writing the script for a movie about one of his books realized his life story wasn't a good story. Yeah. And how he decided to, to do something about that. And I can imagine you have thoughts about that. I have, but I have a different, I have a different perspective on that. I think that notion and idea paralyzes the great majority of us for feeling like we have a story to share. We look at, we look at our lives and say, there's nothing special about it. There's, there's nothing like, like there's nothing. So who am I to go out into the world and say, here's my story. Here's what I believe. Here's what I've been through. We judge ourselves through that lens against these extraordinary examples of stories out there. And we say, there's no way, no how. I'm not Elon Musk, so I'm going to shut my mouth. I'm not dynamic like this guy or that. I'm going to shut my mouth. I didn't lose an arm or come back from the dead. I didn't scale a mountain. I didn't do well. I don't have a $100 million company. So my voice, my story doesn't matter. And I think that is what paralyzes the great majority of us from finding the essence of our core brand and being able to powerfully deliver it and communicate. So my thing is, there is an extraordinary version of you, but because you live with you and you see it every day, you judge it as not. And part of the work when I'm working with business owners, whether they're big or small, is getting them out of that mindset. The path that you travel seems ordinary to you because you've traveled it. But if you turn around and look back from whence you came I almost promise you, you will see a distance that has been covered. And there are millions of people out there who haven't covered that distance yet. So your story, your example, your vision, your values, what you believe, what you've been through, who you are, it can provide the stepping stones to empower other people to take similar steps. But if you sit there and judge your story from the lens of extraordinary, you're always going to be paralyzed and stuck. Yeah, I think in his case, particularly, it did sound like a somewhat boring story um, because this was before before he got into business, before he got into all the charity stuff he was doing. So all he did was watch TV and occasionally write a book about himself. Um, and then a lot of the super interesting stuff he, he did came out of that realization that he had no real meaning in his mm -hmm. life. So it was a bit of a bit that, that was the angle more than the, the extraordinary stuff. But it's also very interesting if you've liked any of his work to see him before he knew any of that and how he started realizing and learning. And obviously he's learned it well enough because he's a big, big guy on the space. Back to, to business. So I know you, you deal with all sorts of different businesses. So what would you say is the easiest areas for business to use story and what are some of the hardest? Okay, so so let's break story down into three key areas, right? So I say that for every business, whether you are a product or you are a personal brand coach or consultant, there are three stories that you want to evaluate and think about. Um, one is your founder story, right? Why? Why do you exist? Uh, why did you create this? What what happened? beforehand to put you in this position. This basically is a story that takes us back in the past. It's your founding. It's your coming out of the primordial pit, if you will. And you need to be able to articulate that and communicate that. The second story is your product story. 
This is the story of the transformations that you are doing with your product or with your services. So how does your service or what do you do in the world? How does it transform lives today? So that's your present story, your, your product story, your, your uh, customer story. The founder story is how you transformed or what was the transformation from the past. And then there's this very important story that is particularly important in this day and age. It's your mission story. What do you stand for? What are you aiming at in the world? How will the world be different because you exist? This is the future story. This is what your, your, the, the, the mission of, of your company, of, of your brand, the thing that you are fighting for in the world. This is the, 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 basically, this is the equity that you'll be able to get in society where you say this brand stands for something. And that's even more important than it has been in the past, given just how socially tuned in people are in general, younger, more so, but in general, two companies who stand for something, not just profitability. So when you think about those three stories, your founder story, your product story, and your mission story, you want to be able to articulate and communicate all three of those. But in my experience, there are going to be one of those stories that are more powerfully connected than the other. And that's the part of marketing and figuring out, does, do, do people come to you because of you have this extraordinary founder story? There are, I have consultants and coaches I work with is be, their why they do what they do is enough to hook people to want to you know, build with them, work with them. I have others who their founder story, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm an advisor to an AI company. No one cares about the advisors. So, I mean, about the, uh, the AI, no one, uh, founders, but their product is freaking amazing. It is revolutionary, right? And no one really cares about their mission in the world because the companies they work with, it can, you know, they're, so it's a product driven story. And then some have a mission driven story. There's, there, there's such a connective piece to what they stand for in the world that people want to support it. It's not because the product is great. It's because of what they stand for. And that gives people a feeling. So all three of those stories go beyond features and functions of your product. They are more about the feelings that these stories create in the minds and hearts of those that you tell them to. And that is what brand is. And that's the difference between a commodity. Commodity is a replaceable, replaceable features and functions, while a brand is an irreplaceable feeling. The stories we tell help to create that. I have a question about about what you call the mission story, mm -hmm. because you disc you said earlier that the power in in a lot of people's stories comes from from the distance traveled. So how do you do that when you you know you're not necessarily talking about experiences you've had, you which gives you a lot of credibility. How do you do that with something that hasn't happened? It has that is a, a great question, and I think a lot of companies right now. Are going forward are going to go, oh, we missed the boat. Everyone's coming out right now and talking about racial injustice, Black Lives Matter, and the support of this. And they're doing all of these, on the surface, very powerful acts of like $100 million donated here or doing that, right? They're trying to build out this story that they stand for something beyond the status quo. I, I commend you on that. But I think where they will fall flat oftentimes is that That is in part of a collective mission to go somewhere. A great story is about distance travel. If it's a future-based story, it's about the fact that you seek to travel this huge, unfathomable distance to where you need to go. And I'll give you an example. Uh, Elon Musk, I mentioned him earlier. He's a unicorn. He has a powerful story, founder story. He has a powerful product story. And he has a powerful mission story. He's trying to save the freaking planet. He's trying to figure out a way to colonize Mars. Like, like, like that is so far futuristic. That is so far in the future in terms of what we're aiming at, in terms of the social good and, and this idea of what he stands for. That story has yet to have been written, but we want to see if he can do it. We want to be a part of that. We want to listen because of the distance that that story seeks to travel. And what would you say, I mean, other distance traveled is, is, is one of the concepts, but other than distance traveled, what are the elements that to you make a good story? Great. Well, we have a, we have a, a story framework when we're working through it. It's called the uh, Lead Your Story Framework. And there are many aspects of story, but I, I've broken it down to four key elements to where you can tell a powerful story pretty quickly. Every great story is going to have problems and pain. 
The hero is going to experience problems and this, those problems are going to cause pain. And the greatest stories go from problem to pain to pit. She's in a dark place. All is lost. Don't know what to do and trying to figure it out. About to quit that breaking point. And we've all experienced that. So every great story has that. So we need to be able to speak to that on some level. Problem, pain, pit. The next is the paradigm. The paradigm is what keeps the hero or she real stuck, the way they thought about a thing. And ultimately, the, the, the shift in the story from the hero going from this pit to escaping is that they get a new paradigm, a new way of thinking. Something enlightens them. Something gives them this new hope or this key to the jail cell, right? So it could be Yoda in Luke Skywalker, or it could be Nyla in The Lion King and reminding Simba of the fact that he is supposed to be this king. There is something that shifts the paradigm. All of the great brands that we associate, whether it's Apple, Nike, even Amazon, they shifted the paradigm of how we think about a thing and created a whole new feeling and sensation. Apple, think different. Nike, just do it. We Those brands cause us to shift how we think about ourselves, think about the world, and that paradigm shift is the, the the gold lining inside of a brand. So you need to think about what keeps the hero stuck or kept you stuck. And then what what knowledge or insight helps you to overcome that thinking. That's the paradigm. The, thir- the third is power. It's this the active steps that you take to escape prison. So think of it like this. You're in the jail, in the pit. The paradigm unlocks your jail cell. But you're still behind enemy walls. You still have to escape the prison. You got the keys to your jail, so you still got to escape the prison, right? So you need to tell the story of how you escaped prison, step by step. What did you do? Power. I did step one, step two, step three, step four. How did you escape the prison? Because a story that doesn't show the hero escaping and it just ends in this this happy ending, we feel cheated. Like, I want to see what you did or hear what you did. And then the last is, of course, pleasure. It's the four P's. Pleasure, like pleasure in terms of what did you get? Uh, if, if you didn't get anything, it's a horrible story. We want to know that there's a winning something on the end, something uh, extrinsic material and something intrinsic, um, you know, something that's deeper and humanly connects us to, you know, something at a, at a, at a much deeper level. So I know I, I said that, but it, there are four P's, basically problems, paradigm, power, pleasure. And then doing it in that order allows you to tell a really great story. It's interesting because if you studied uh, Joseph Campbell and and all of the classics, it's interesting how talking to a lot of people that that deal with storytelling and teach storytelling, you you get individual versions of the hero's journey. Some people like Donald Miller love the you know beginning to end with seven different steps on it. Some people have a version like yours which you know some steps you can clearly recognize some are just a tweak on it i just find interesting how how it's difficult to go completely off that right. you know there are certain things you can do that give a distinct flavor to it but but it is very difficult to have a good story when you're not touching on some of those of those points i think it's a very very interesting thing you say there because the power in story isn't because we decided to make it up like, hey, I, I think stories are powerful, so let's tell them. No, it, it, it's because they're, it actually has a neurophysiological impact on our body. Our brains are hardwired to connect to stories. They've, they've done recent stories, uh, I mean, um, studies to show like the, you know, oxytocin, endorphins, all types of things are released when we are immersed in a story. And I hazard to guess that it's due to our evolutionary you know, we connected to stories because even before we could communicate in, in you know, with language, maybe go back, you know, a, a few hundred thousand years, whatever the case may be, we had to listen to the stories of other individuals to understand our world and to sidestep the dangers. So our brain, when it hears problems and pain, it goes, oh, I better listen, Francisco, because I don't want any parts of that. So I need to know what happened to put you there. How did you get out of it? And then what did you get? And I think unlike any other creature on this planet, our capacity to understand stories 
and then to build upon them and to share a collective narrative, which has allowed us to be the most dominant creature on the planet. It is our capacity to tell stories, believe in them, and to organize our behavior and our actions according to that narrative. That has allowed us to build and progress. No other creature on the planet does that. It can't build upon the previous generation because it doesn't have a story or the narrative of the way to transmit information to progress. I, I completely agree. And, and I think that as much as this can be proved, I'm pretty sure it is, has been proved that it's an evolutionary adaptation. And, and it's, it's interesting when you pay attention to your own thoughts, as, as I know you do, how this process of, okay, this happened. Why? And what does it mean now? It's, it's almost impossible for us to understand anything without context. In, in, in what was before, what does it mean now? So that, that very, you know, seconds process, seconds long process is our brain making a story out of everything. Right. And it, it's something I found very interesting the more I got into something like meditation, which I know you are a practitioner of, is how the incredible thing that happens in your brain when you drop the story. And there's a, as much as story is powerful, having no story has has a big impact as well. Yeah, I agree. I agree. We are driven by context and contrast. We can't tell what left is until we really understand what right is. So the the story gives us the ability to 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 create variables that we can understand, and now we can judge our reality against. And to your point, when you throw away the story, like as an exercise, you know, meditating, um, you know, for a whole couple of years, I went through this process where. My, my meditative journey was always to ask the question, why? Why does that matter? Why does that matter? Why does that matter? And when I got down to the root of it, it always became because I decided to make it matter. That's the story. There was a story that connected this to something of importance. And when I dissolved that, it was like, holy crap, like, like none of this matters. It's all dependent upon what we believe, buy into, and decide to accept as the narrative that you know defines our reality and we're we're freed when we can let go of those stories and understand they're not important or have value of and by themselves it's only because we buy into them um so yeah that's a very powerful point and this is something that i was just thinking about this just before we, we started how i thought that this year's big story was the pandemic right so this this shaped up to be the year of of COVID. That was the story that we were going to remember. And this is the story we're going to talk about. What happened in the US a few weeks ago seems to have changed that. And, and what I was talking, what I was thinking of is how to sometimes the difficulty of squaring these narratives, because on the one hand, and this is, I'm now thinking to your background, right? So, yeah. so the US is a country that has this narrative of if you want it, you can get it. Mm -hmm. As long as you work hard enough, you can get it. But part of the reason why your story is so powerful is because you you got where you got to coming out of Oakland. Mm -hmm. If you had been born in Silicon Valley, there was no story. Right. But at the same time, you're trying to, one is this, you can achieve if you put your mind to it. But on the other hand, we know that that's not the full truth. There, right. There's another narrative there. And, and, and how do people balance those things? Yeah, yeah. I think that's the challenge. As much as we are hardwired for story, I think we're hardwired for the cognitive bias that comes into that story, meaning that we are more apt to connect to a story that is cleanly one thing, right? The, 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 the promise of bootstrap, pull yourself up, anyone can do it. I'm an example of that. I come from a place, you know, like 500 freshmen in my high school uh, class, only 33 of us graduated. My brother was murdered. Like, 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 I, I, I know what it looks like to come from nothing and then to be the first person to go to school, get an Ivy League degree, start my own business. Like, my kids are experiencing things that I would have never dreamed of coming up in Oakland during the height of the like crack pandemic. I am an example of pulling myself up by my bootstraps. But the fact that that story exists does not make the other side of the coin less valid. But I believe that. Powerful stories pull us to the extremes and we tend to buy into one 
And and through that polarization, we forget that there are other possibilities, that this is just a story, not a not the story. This is just a story. And, and, and one more point on this. I think technology and where we are has exacerbated that idea. The promise of technology was to bring us together. It was going to connect us in profound and meaningful ways. But I would have and it has done that to a degree. But I would say that the dangers of technology is, is that it has allowed us to self-segregate segregate into the ideas that confirm what we already believe. You go back 30 years ago, we had to exchange stories and ideas. We had to, we had to accept different things because there wasn't an echo chamber that says Francisco is right or X is always right. Now we can join the cubbyhole that says what we think in this very narrow bandwidth is the truth, not a truth, but the truth. And that has empowered us to believe in that narrative and allowed us to become more siloed, polarized, and disconnected in ways that technology has actually exacerbated. So, yeah, yeah, that's uh, stories are powerful, uh, and that's exactly why technology is allowed, uh, in many ways, has has used the power of that that inclination towards story to to pull us apart. Yeah, and and I completely agree with the po- your point about what we we thought technology was going to do. We uh, we had this idealistic view that well we, if you want to find out something's true you're just going to look it up and the information is going to be there what we we neglected and and this is again as many things it's a it's a double-edged sword is that it's beautiful that doesn't matter how unique or weird you are and as a weirdo i appreciate this you can find your tribe your tribe is out there and now you can find it but if you're also the guy who believes that the earth is flat and you were the only one, and you couldn't talk to anyone because they thought you were a lunatic, now there are thousands and thousands of people that feel the same way. And now points of view that, you know, everybody's entitled to their points of view, but but that, that weren't perhaps necessarily very helpful to a communi- to a conversation that pushes us forward, they have all gotten uh, a lot more validity, and, and it's become very difficult to cut through the noise. All right, All right. And, and in many ways, I think the danger of that as we continue to go forward is that as more of these tribes are able to disseminate their information easily to the world, we, we be, I think we're becoming more cynical because we, we don't know how to extrapolate what's real from what's fake. And that line every day is being encroached upon. And, and that's, that would be my, my biggest fear. Like my kids, I, I, I always tell them, ask yourself the question, is that true? And how do you know it's true? The internet, d- don't tell me the internet said, how do you know that's true? And, and I'm old enough to have this like gut sense of when something just seems a little bit off and what sources to believe and what stories to, you know, to buy into and connect to. But my kids, that part of them, because they were born into this internet world, they don't have that. And, and we're not teaching them how to, hone that level of of scrutiny um so they're becoming more pessimistic disbelieving and when you have that you want to find truth so what do you do you go to the easiest most acceptable narrow truth that confirms what you already believe it's like a it's like a vicious cycle to 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 your point and that that would be one of my, my fears as we go forward how do we as leaders find a way to bring people together um, not not saying what you believe isn't important, but let's put the facts on the table and let's find a way to build a bridge towards a, a collective common good. I think until we do that, we'll we'll continue to see more um, dysfunction and chaos. Well, one thing that we should do is all the politicians that are let's let's call them the better ones should hire shit hot storytellers and put them on their staff because as we've seen recently. Whoever tells the better story wins. Yeah. It doesn't need to be true. It just needs to be a more compelling story. So if your story is, you know, I'm going to drain the swamp, and it's a compelling enough story as it was, people will believe you, and people will be motivated by it, and they will support you, even though everything else you do, everything else you do doesn't necessarily support that story. I've been talking to other people about this, but... We storytelling has become this buzzword, and and it's something that is oh, it's great for marketing, and it's great for sales, it's great for all these things. No, it's one of the most powerful tools that exists, and we don't think of it that way. But when when our leaders 
are telling a story and a whole country is believing that story, that has the greatest possible impact. Yeah. And if we don't get people, you know, maybe the people that are pulling in the right direction to be good at that, they might lose with better ideas just because they can tell a better story. Yeah. Here's a silver lining. Everything you just said is 100% true. I, I believe it's been true. The person who tells the best story wins, but the person who lives that story is a better long-term bet. So the disconnect between the story told and the story lived will create the dissonance and disconnection as we start to see if that truth is given. I think the, 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 the major you know, energetic movement that is happening here in in the United States with you know George Floyd and all this stuff that that that's not a new story. What it was is a a horrific, visual, deeply emotionally heart wrenching story being told of the disconnect between the reality of what is actually happening and the promise of what the story says is supposed to be. That lived reality. We could see it, feel it, taste how 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 it, it's not making good on that promise. And that brought people to arms, to action. So I think if if one thing technology does allow us to do, it allows us to see the disconnect between what is actually lived and done versus what story is portrayed. So the best story wins in the short term, but I do believe that the story that is lived congruently and there is a contract and a covenant to make sure that the reality matches up with what we're saying. I think those are the long-term winners because the, I think the younger generation has an expectation. There's a, there's an expectation of what the promise is to, is that that needs to be our reality. And we call them lazy. We call them uh, disconnected. We call them idealist. We have all these words for what we call millennials. Like I'm just outside of millennial range being a Gen Xer, but I believe what they're saying is, dude, you've got all these things that you've promised and you haven't been delivering. I'm going to I want to hold you accountable to that. And I think older generations just told the line because we weren't as connected to the to the idea that this promise was disconnected from what the reality we bought into. If we just work hard enough, put our heads down, ignore everything else, we'll figure it out. I think younger generation is like, no, dude, show me right now that this reality or promise there's a real path toward it. I think that transparency around what's actually happening, long story long, <laughs> marketers, great stories win short term. But I think long term, those who live them congruently are the ones who will be around the longest. I agree with, with everything you said. And I would interpret that one of the reasons why perhaps what happened just now with, with George Floyd might be having such a big impact is something that has become clearer and clearer to me the more I learned about storytelling and the more I studied and, and talked to other people about it, which is that stories live on specific moments. If a story is broad and not close enough to what is happening, it's harder for us to connect with it emotionally. And the, sto the, the history of the civil rights movement hinges on this thing. So we go back to Rosa Parks and, and that moment made a massive difference. And way before that, there were other moments. And, and I think this, as you said, technology has allowed us to literally see what happened. Nobody told us this because we've heard these stories before. Unfortunately, we heard the stories hundreds of times, but there was no way to avoid seeing that. And I think if you saw that, you can't unsee it. Right. Knowing exactly what happened and hearing him and all of that horrible scene, you can't get that off your mind. So whenever you hear anything else you hear of what the story is about, what happened, that scene is what everything else revolves around and the power of it. As much as someone might say, well, it, it's an accident and this and the statistics, are this, I don't care because that's not how we understand reality. We understand reality through stories and we understand stories through their specific and most powerful moments. And that as unfortunately, was as powerful as a moment can get. Right. So, and, I'll, and I'll echo that, that the power in story is emotional first. It's the emotion the, the, that we feel at a gut level. We back it up intellectually with rationality after the fact. And, and, and great brands do that. We 
if, if Mercedes says the the best you can get or all right, I, I, I need to feel a certain way about that. And then once I get my Mercedes, I'm going to rationalize it by saying that it goes from zero to 60 this way. And it goes. From, but it was the feeling first. It was the story. It was the idea that captivated us. And then we use rationality to back it up. I know that's the way our brains work. But that scares me, too, in the sense that if I think society in the the, the greater, grander ways in which we run and govern ourselves um, succumbs to that human, very human thing. I think the scientific process, leaning on fact, leaning on process and truly understanding, arming ourselves with that notion and, and, and allowing us to, to rule and govern our lives by that, I think we'd be in a more just place. But that's me speaking uh uh, in some wished reality. That's not, that's not, that's not how we function. That's not what we do. So you better tell good stories. <laughs> well, I, listen, I, I, I understand that concern uh, and I understand the concern. Uh, but just today I was talking to, to a friend who, who works in marketing, who, who is a study sociology. And he was talking to me about how the older he gets and the more he studies, the more he realizes that there is no such thing as homo economicus, you know, the rational man that makes rational decisions. And, and I think that there's a lot of, there's a lot of power and a lot of good to get out of us realizing that we are somewhat overdeveloped apes because a lot of the things that make us happy make for a good world you know we we spend time with the people we love and we share stories and and that's what really makes us happy you know the mercedes is nice and there's a lot of other things that are very nice but there is this basic human interaction and human connection that is how we evolved to to understand the world and be happy and we seem to have forgotten a lot of that but you find that you know i'm from brazil and and some of the the communities that struggle the hardest are the most knit together and they're some of the happiest people right they're not happy because it's warm yeah it's lovely that it's warm but but if you go see how they live they're next to their friends and family all the time all right there's music there's football there's there's good food there's you know attractive people that helps but they are just spending time with the people that they love which is how we evolved to be and and that part we need to remember of being animals and being biological Right. The rational stuff sometimes I think takes us a bit out of that. And that's not necessarily a good thing. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree in the sense that that happiness comes from some very simple human things and positioning our life and in, in crafting a life, creating a life that aligns with that, I think, doesn't happen on, on accident. It, there's a there's a, a especially here in the West, you, there's you have to create a very purposeful track to finding that essence of, of your why and what really moves you because you can get lost in all the noise. I think the, the, the polling across industrialized countries in terms of happiness, United States is always at the bottom. So, you know, our God is productivity and the gods of productivity and profit uh, don't make for happy people. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just whatever story and narrative you believe in, there's pros to it and there's cons to it. There's no all good. There's no all bad. So so collectively, just thinking, what is it that you actually want um, and how do you build a, a culture and belief and a system around it so that the people are happy, productive, fulfilled and can self-actualize all happiness with, uh, you know, without productivity put you in a position where you're not developing or you're not you're not growing. So there's there's, there's that's why I think. The human existence isn't about the polarities of a thing. It is about finding the happy equilibrium between things. Everything in nature, every system, the planets even, everything in the atom, every part of existence is about the equilibrium between parts, not about the extremes and running to one side or the other. But again, that is a very complex story. It's not neat. It's not black and white. And it isn't very compelling emotionally. So we tend to just choose one. I can be happy or I can be rich. Is, is that true? Nah, you know, I, I don't know. I, you know, I can be rich. I, in my mind, I want to be rich and righteous and happy and fulfilled. All of it. I want all of it. Well, I got to create a whole new story and narrative to be able to approach that. And I don't think the, the, the status quo story fits the things that I say I want. So I choose to believe and create and author and narrate a different story for my life. 
I realize that we are we're coming up to the to the time we were supposed to be recording this, and I had mentioned some of the crazy stuff you've gotten up to. So I would be I would be wronging my listeners if I didn't touch on some of that. Uh -huh. So so let me just ask you. I will let you pick because there's no shortage of stuff there. But either I would like to know how you stopped a jail riot. Okay. All right. Or what the hell were you doing? Becoming an MMA fighter. <laughs> Okay, let's start with the let's start with the, the jail riot. So I'm 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 doing a program inside of a, a prison. It's called 60 Days to Live, and I'm there to to uplift and empower prisoners. And at the time, I had been studying NLP since I was 12. Like I I you know, I don't know if you know what NLP is like neuro linguistic programming and language patterns, things of this nature. And there's this thing called a um this pattern where you can uh you can run on someone to figure to have them go into a movie theater, look at their life on the screen. Etc. So I have 20 prisoners in a circle in this three tier uh, block and the, all the prisoners don't have to participate. It's, it's voluntary. So I pull some of my guy out and I go through the process, you know, and I tell him to close his eyes, walk into a movie theater, see his life on the screen. Right? I've done this a thousand times in my own head and I don't even think it's all that powerful a process, but I'm like, let's let's do it. Francisco, five seconds into closing his eyes, he freaks out. This dude freaks out and loses it, starts screaming and hollering and, and going crazy. Five seconds in, I tell him, come walk in, sit down in a movie theater. The screen opens. Now it's your life. The thing that causes you pain, I want you to see it. He loses it. When he loses it, the other guys around in the twin start losing it. Then everybody else in their cells start coming out and leaning over the thing. And then they start throwing shit. And then it's about it, it's a riot about to start. I'm freaking out inside. Because you started a riot. <laughs> yeah. I, I, <laughs> I'm freaking out inside, right? But here's, here's what I tell people. When you throw yourself into situations that require a fierce urgency of now, you will find out who you are. Without thinking, I grabbed the back of his neck, pulled his head towards mine. I don't know what I said. I don't know how I got him through it, but he calmed down. The prison, the the jail, uh, the guard stopped calling and locking down everything. The inmates above stopped throwing shit, and the people around in a circle, right? He came out of it. it. I don't know if it was thirty seconds or three minutes. I just held him by the back of his neck, and whatever I said, I'm sure I ran every pattern I could think of. He came out of it, and then he said to me with tears in his eyes, he said, "I can't feel the pain anymore." And then everybody in the in the in the circle said, "Oh my God, he's Professor X." They sort of asked. That's when I got the name Professor X. All right. <laughs> so then the next day when I showed up, instead of twenty guys down there, we had almost one hundred and fifty. So yeah, it, it, it that was crazy. Is that is that where the X comes from? No, my last name is X, but they but they someone started someone said he's Professor X because I you know we went deep or whatever. And uh, so Listen, yeah, you're, you're talking. You're talking to a to a comic book nerd, yeah. right? So <laughs> I keep finding this weird superhero connections to people's lives. But you know, uh, I think you'd make a pretty good Professor X. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So that that was um, a very powerful moment for me. Um, but the the takeaway is, you don't know what you are capable of until you throw yourself into the moment, and. That moment of fierce urgency re required of me to pull something out that I didn't know I had. And I would have never have found it if I, the opportunity didn't, didn't present itself. So sometimes we stop ourselves because we say we can't, we haven't. But put yourself in that position. I promise you, you'll find something that you never know, knew you had. So that's story one. The MMA fighting stuff is mainstream now. But I, I, I started a company called 40 Consulting when I, when I graduated from school. and we were very successful. I was a consultant on building businesses. And I received the phone call one night um, from my, my mom and she was screaming and hollering. And she was like, they killed him. They killed him. And I'm like, what are you talking about? She's crying, hollering, your brother, he's been shot. And, um, you know, he lived that life back in Oakland, California, somehow that I was able to escape. And uh, going back to Oakland to his funeral, I, I was mulling over our last conversation I had with him where he told me I wasn't a good big brother. He said, I wasn't the brother that he needed. And at the time I told him bullshit. I said, look, you had every opportunity I had. You grew up in the same neighborhood. You could have followed my example and did what I did, but you chose not to. That's on you. Don't put it on me. Right before I was doing his eulogy, 
something in me snapped and I finally got it. I started to like, you ever like evaluate your life from top to bottom and you start seeing a pattern? And I saw the pattern of how I was truly scared to lead. I, I was frightened of it. When I was ever voted captain of the football of the team, I'd be like, no, nah, I don't want it. You wanted me to be school president? No, nah, I don't want it. You wanted me to do something? I don't want it. You wanted me to take my brother? I mean, no, nah, I don't want it. Just follow me, do what I do, but I'm not about to take responsibility for you. You just, you know, you do you. And I said, where did that come from? And I was like, I was truly scared to lead. So when I gave his eulogy, I said, you know, um, I'll never turn down an opportunity to lead again in my life. When I feel fear, I'm going to attack it. Shortly after that, I get home and I'm walking out of my, my, my middle class neighborhood onto the stoop. And uh, I do one of these, like I look left, I look right, I look left, I look right before I get into my car. And I'm like, what, what was that? And it, I, I realized that was fear. Remember I said, every time I feel fear, I'm going to attack it. And I felt fear because growing up in Oakland, you always had to keep your head on the swivel. You didn't know who was coming from where. So I ran in the house and said to my wife, I said, hey, I'm scared of physical confrontation to get into fights. I'm scared. She's like, what are you talking about? I said, I, you know, she, I, I said, I look left. And, and I saw on the TV, this was like 2001, 2002. I saw a, a, a UFC um, ad or something or, or fight you know, being uh, promoted. I said, I'm going to go get in the cage and fight. And my wife was like, no, you're not. I was like, yes, I am. So a year later, I was a professional mixed martial arts fighter. I was fighting professionally um, to overcome the fear of physical confrontation. So I had a few fights. And, How many uh, fights did it take for you to feel, okay, I've overcome this fear now. I can stop it fighting. You know, it, I had three fights, professional fights. And um, this was way before it was mainstream. When I was fighting, it was still illegal in 48 states. And we fought on Indian reservations or Native American reservations. Um, some of the places that it was, uh, you know, and the, the weight classes were off. It was, it was this, it was like the wild, wild west. It was still called uh, no holds barred fighting. Uh, my last fight was in 2004. Um, so that's 16 years ago, 17 years ago. So, yeah, yeah. So that was crazy. I, and people are, are surprised to hear that I used to be a, a mixed martial arts fighter. I still train to this day, but I'm not, I'm not jumping into a ring, uh, you know, fighting these days. And I think that around that time, this was, now the dates fail me, but but this would have been not too far or, or not before the, the Royce Gracie heyday, which yeah. obviously, and as a Brazilian, we, we follow that very closely. But looking back on it now, it was just sheer madness. There were no weight classes. There were no, I don't know if there was a time limit. They just fought until someone gave up or, or yeah. fell down. That was uh, my first introduction. I used to watch the tapes. I remember the the famous Gracie fighting like a four hundred uh, Gracie fight like a four hundred pound guy. This was like UFC one, like it was back in the day, like in my college dorm room watching it on VHH, VHS ta tapes. So yeah, it was it was a wild wild west. It was it was just starting to get a foothold in the U.S. And yeah, I I, I partook for a little bit, and then I I said, okay, I'm over it. it it's enough. It's enough. <laughs> uh, I have one last question for you, which is. Uh, are your kids already at the age that you need to pay pay for pay forward what your father did for you and take them to a Toastmasters meeting? Uh they are my my oldest is in college. So I have three. She my oldest is 18, then I have a 16 year old and I have an eight year old. And all of them publicly speak from time to time, but none of them have, say, gone through Toastmasters. I love Toastmasters and I'm an advocate for it. I tell people, if, if, if you want to learn how to powerfully communicate, Toastmasters isn't a place to go to do it. Toastmasters is a place to go to learn how to get over your fear of public speaking. It's basically the ring. It's like getting into a ring. But if you say, hey, I want to become a very powerful storyteller and communicator, you're going to have to go outside of the confines of Toastmasters. They, they provide a very safe, structured environment for you to practice. Mm. But again, you got to throw yourself into those fierce urgency of now moments to really learn what works with a real audience who doesn't, who isn't there to applaud you. You know, the Toastmasters, you're going to get a, you're going to get a good job or add a boy every time you step up. Mm -hmm. When you go into the real world, they're going to be like, you're going to hear mm -hmm. crickets. You're going to bomb sometimes like I have, you know, I've, I've spoken thousands of times. You, there will be audiences where you're, they, they just, they're just not going to feel you. And you're going to have to learn and grow through that 
And that's when you start to learn how to powerfully communicate. Yeah, it's a it's a place to get reps. Yeah. And and it's also it's also a place to have this experience that most of us don't have in our personal lives, which is doesn't matter what you say, people will applaud you. Now, you know, I love my wife. She's not applauding me. You know, my mates are definitely not applauding me. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. so to, you know, it's it's a great place to, as you said, I mean, it's one of the very few structured places where if you are in America, particularly in America, but pretty much anywhere, I'm, I'm in Barcelona and there's 15 clubs in Barcelona. Right, if right. you want to find a place where you can speak every single week, that's it. Right? There's, there's no other place to practice. So yeah. it's, uh, it's, you know. Play, it's a place to go spar, right? Mm. If you back into the the fight realm it's a place to go spar get in the ring you know exchange some jabs figure out what it means to punch and to throw and to learn your combos and 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 all the aspects but you don't really really learn until you step out of the sparring the headgear comes off and now you're you're in a you're in an actual match and you have to see what you got so i tell people go but if your if your goal is to over not just overcome fear after the first you know booklet you go through jump into what's next you know mm. yeah no, i i fully agree with that mm. where can uh, where can people find you uh you know you can go to my my website leadyourstory.com or find me on linkedin hasani x h a s a n i letter x but um if you're if you're in stateside you can text me to this number 855 855- Nine 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 eight 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 zero, and put in the keyword story, and that will just put you on my list. And I, I text my audience, and we we communicate that way. So eight five five nine 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 eight 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 zero, and then just put in the word story, and then um, you'll be asked, do you want to learn more about brand? Do you want to learn about relaunching? Do you, you know it'll ask you a few questions, and then we'll communicate that way. I'll, I'll stick that in the show notes, so so people are not don't have to get the pen and paper out and, <laughs> and start yeah. start writing things down. So so it will be there. Uh, listen, mate, it's been it's been a pleasure. I uh, I hope I managed to 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 go slightly outside some of the things uh, uh, you you always say. But you know, we covered a lot of, of of very useful ground on storytelling. But I think we talked about other stuff that is that is also very interesting and very very important. So thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. All right, everybody, thanks for tuning in. Take care of yourselves, and until next time.